Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I see his blood upon the rose, and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows, his tears fall from the skies. I see his face in every flower, the thunder and the singing of the birds are but his voice, and carven by his power, rocks are his written words. All pathways by his feet are worn. His strong heart stirs the ever-beating sea. His crown of thorns is twined with every thorn. His cross is every tree. A poem by Irish revolutionary, devout Catholic Joseph Mary Plunkett. I see his blood upon the rose. I'm Father Brendan Kilcoyne, coming to you from Athen Rye, County Galway. Courtesy of Immaculata Productions, producing quality Catholic material for the new Irish Catholic experience. We're calling this the Brendan Option, named after St. Brendan. If you were to ask me what's so specific about the Brendan Option as opposed to the Benedict Option of Rod Dreher, the Dominic Option of C.C. Pecknold, I think what I'd say to you is, is that it has a satisfying Irish willingness to throw your money on a horse and stop endlessly studying the form to get in a boat and sail off and find America. I think in these podcasts, what I'm trying to say is that sooner or later, you just have to take over the GPO and start a rebellion. You know, sooner or later, you have to make a start with things. You have to get on with things. And I think what I'm pleading for in the Irish Catholic revolution Look, I don't even like the word revolution, or I certainly don't like the word restoration. You know, they're too contrived. The church is the church, the faith is the faith. God builds the kingdom, God builds the church, God creates the church. It it is the new way of being Catholic in this Ireland. And I don't see how you can do that. As I said in the last podcast, I don't see how you can do that unless you somehow love or hate your country. But I don't think that someone indifferent to the place and time in which they have been born, formed, nourished, oppressed, whatever it is, I don't think that that person can possibly appreciate the Incarnation. Because the Incarnation is literally God accepting the carnis, the the flesh. In Greek, the sarx, the scandal of the Incarnation. And I don't think that you can understand Christianity or accept it unless you engage with your own place and time, your country and its history. I'm putting that out there. And I can't claim to be well read in this, in the Russians, but I think Dostoevsky would have agreed with me. I think Solzhenitsyn would have agreed with me. I'm certain Porrick Pierce and Joseph Mary Plunkett and all the other ardent Irish patriots showed such tremendous courage in the founding of Irish freedom, a political freedom, cultural freedom, I I think they would have agreed with me. Throughout the 1916 rebellion, to my knowledge, the rosary was recited continuously in the GPO. Christianity is inseparable from the rebellion, which was at Easter, and deliberately so. Even though it went off notoriously half-cocked, Was it Ruth Dudley Edwards, the historian, who described it as the triumph of failure? And I heard John Waters lately in an interview again reprise this theme. If we are afraid of failure, we're going to do nothing here. And I'll furthermore say to you, if we're afraid of failure, we cannot possibly hope to understand God's intentions for us because we cannot understand Jesus Christ, who in worldly terms was a flop, a failure, a washout. That is what Golgotha is. It's disgrace and defeat. It's your name in the paper. The great fear of the Irish village. That fellow will get his name in the paper. It's as if Jesus proved right the old saying that we know was there at the time, did anything good ever come out of Nazareth? As far as the high priests were concerned, this must have looked like the rake's progress. He ended on the gallows. We are facing so many challenges 
And we are having to begin again in so many different ways. And beginning is so lonely. And for Irish people, we are so afraid of being laughed at. We are so afraid of failure. Our self-esteem, to use that horrible modern phrase, is so, it is so fragile. Precisely because it's not self-esteem. Precisely because what we call self-esteem is inextricable from the, the many of which we are a part. And we so want to be loved. Didn't Aristotle observe this? I can't remember. I don't know how many people really want to be admired or respected. I, an awful lot of people, even in politics, want to be loved. Very hard to do. I'd say it's hard enough to get respect. But to get love, that's very hard to do. We want to be loved. We're so unwilling to say things that are unpopular. We're so unwilling to upset and the starts that we're going to have to make, they're going to be so fragile, they're going to be so dangerous socially, they're going to be so dangerous politically, we're going to lose friends over it. This path we, a lot of us don't want. Very few are going to do this, because this journey will be in winter, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, here, I know you're going to say to me, you've been watching too much Game of Thrones, but Game of Thrones is a fantastic modern conservative allegory. I really feel... Winter is here for the church in the West. It's here. And this journey will be in winter. If you have forgotten your winter woolies, I suggest you go back and pack them because you're not going to need your shorts where we're going. My generation won't need them. We'd be buried in our wellies. Maybe the young crowd now, they'll see better times. I, again, you know, I've said this before. We need to accept this. I think we have everything we need in our faith, but I, I would go further. We have everything we need for this journey in our faith as it has been lived on this wet little island for 1500 years. Now it's our journey and it's to be made by us, but we are absolutely crazy if we abandon the tradition, which Roger Scruton in our modern times kept reminding us, is the call of the dead to us. The dead are constantly talking to us. And if, if we abandon those voices, the, the, the voices of the dead who are trying desperately to talk to us, to warn us, to advise us, to encourage us, we really will make a dreadful hash of this. We may not even start, and the faith may die out in Ireland. And so this is going to be hard. And unless it's a faith that's incarnate, it must be incarnate. So it must be Catholic faith, but it must be the Catholic faith in Ireland. Now, the church has always been afraid of Irish Catholicism, French Catholicism, German Catholicism, and you can see the danger. Okay, there are no new heresies. These things have all happened before. You know, it'll just become the nation at prayer, which in a sense, maybe Catholicism did in this country. Maybe, certainly John Waters would say that that was part of our problem. But if it's not Irish, it's not going to be Catholicism. And now you may react with outrage to this. There was a Cardinal Archbishop in America, I won't be any more precise, but there was a legend about him that, because of course the Irish ended up controlling City Hall and controlling the church. And there was a legend about him that he had too many in the seminary and the seminary was packed and he called for the list and he struck off every non-Irish name. <laughs> I'm not saying you have to be Irish to be Catholic. That would be a ridiculously insular and stupid thing to say. We received the faith from far more sophisticated cultures. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying you can't be Catholic in Ireland without being an Irish Catholic. Pope Francis has talked about this and he's got help from the people I call the neocons, from the young Turks, the young Catholics coming up for it because they feel he goes too far with this enculturation thing. And enculturation is a dangerous business. The faith is a dangerous business. If you're not up for a bit of danger, you're as well to forget it. We have to be Catholics in Ireland. We have to be, I, I'm sorry, I don't know other, any other way of saying it. We have to be Irish Catholics. An Italian-American took in to me one day years ago for, for talking about this, and he said, you go on about Irish Catholicism, Irish Catholicism. He said, when I was a kid, they told us we were Roman Catholics. Now I'm here, and there's another version of it. <laughs> now he had a point, okay? It's a danger. I, I love that poem by Joseph Mary Plunkett. I love it in the way that he sees Christ in nature, which was the great genius often too of the, of the Gaelic sense, of the, the Irish sense. I love the incarnate nature of his faith. 
I see his, his blood upon the roth. His tears fall from the skies. Can you imagine the soft Irish rain that goes on. It would drive you mad. It has driven the whole nation to drink. And the idea of that is Christ weeping. What a beautiful image. And these are the people who set our country free. And not free of an awful tyranny. I mean, the, the English people are one of the finest peoples on the face of the earth. But we were in a bad place in that they were smothering us. And we were trying to get out from under them. We were trying to, to be us. And now we're busy being transatlantic nobodies. We're busy in a desperate lemming-like rush to become Euro trash. Not even Euro trash. Euro cheap memorabilia, I don't know. Not even trash. Trash is interesting. People who deracinated, people who belong nowhere. I don't want to belong nowhere. I, I want, when people meet me, I want them to go off thinking, God, what a bogger. You know, I've been just talking to that dreadful fiend for the last three hours and, oh Lord, what a bore. The bog water dripping off him. When I was a kid and, and I went from, I'm, I'm from the west coast of Mayo and I went to school in a, a famous boarding school called St. Charlotte's College in Chum. When I went there, it was only 70 miles away, like 7 oh, 70 miles away, right? And they thought I was Scottish because we had a very particular accent where I came from. And these were people from Westport. There was one guy from Eccle thought I was Scottish. From Eccle, shapers tonight. No offence against Eccle, which is a beautiful and glorious place. But I mean, it's not as if they could afford to look down on, on Lewisburg like, you know. <laughs> All right, cheapers, I'm getting in more trouble here the more I talk. I'm not saying either that it's bad to be Scottish. It's wonderful to be Scottish. We love you, Scots. Okay, there's nothing wrong with being Scottish, but you see my point. They thought my accent was foreign, that it was strange. And it was a particular kind of a rolling R. And I still have school books with Brendan written on the back of them, where my schoolmates, being disagreeable, wrote my name with about 15 R's in it. Okay, my sister's got the same slagging, you know. And I mean, that's just an area that was southwest, south of Lewisburg, and it had its own accent. I was told by people in Connemara that the Irish in Rossmuck and the Irish in Carna was at one stage quite distinct, if you knew Irish, quite distinct, with even different vocabulary. And we're losing all of that. This is happening all over Europe. I heard a parish priest in Rome talk about this. He came from the Abruzzo, which is a mountainous area of Italy. And he was talking about this 30 years ago. I don't know where the young people come from anymore. You listen to them and they don't have any accent. Unless they're from the places that really rich accents, like maybe Cork or, I don't know, Belfast or Limerick. You know what I'm getting at. But so many young people now, they talk like Americans. And I mean, all right, there's nothing wrong with being American, okay? I love Americans. We love you, America. I love Americans, but I'm not American. I'm an Irish bog trotter. That's what I am. You give me a bog, I will trot on same. That's what I do. That's what my people have done for centuries. It is the story of my people. We have to be ourselves and we have to work this out here in Ireland. I'm aiming this at the young Catholics I was talking about in the last podcast. The ones on whom all our hopes are being pinned and who are getting ready to do a runner. Yes, you are. And don't pretend you're not. Okay, your feet are itching. You're looking over at America and, and at Catholic Disneyland over there. You just want to go over there to one of these incredible new Catholic movements and Catholic communities and live there because, as usual, the Yanks are about 20 years ahead of us. Like, and the whole thing is just so sickening. And we're, we're mission territory and they regard us as mission territory. And what kills me altogether is that they're right. We are mission territory. But as the Americans who have worked in missionary work here will tell us straight away, only the Irish can sort out their own mess. Because I'll tell you, you won't convert the Irish too easily. They're tough people. We used to be tough and Catholic. Now we're just tough. These are the people that broke the British Empire. Only saints can convert the Irish. We have no martyrology from the great conversion in the time of Patrick. No martyrology. We just seem to have accepted the faith. If they hadn't wanted to, Patrick would have been served up in a stew because the Irish were a ferocious warlike people. The faith, I don't know, it just made sense to them. And it doesn't make sense to them anymore. This is unprecedented in our entire history. 
And the second thing we lost is, is our women. We have lost our women. And that means we've lost the men because the men were just told what to do by the women for all of Irish history. And the women understood and understand religion almost instinctively. You can down me for being sexist and patronising. I know what I'm talking about. I've seen the difference for years as a priest. So we really are in a tough place here. And we lost our men a long time ago in the sense that, as I said, the women made up their minds for them on this. I know that's not fair. But I have a point. We have had an increasingly feminized church and that's been going on long before the council, so don't start about the council. We blame the council for everything. Some of this stuff has been going on long before it. An increasingly feminized church, and no, there's nothing wrong with being feminine. But a feminized church is a different thing. That's a church that's unbalanced. You need the male and female knocking off each other. And we've lost male piety. So this, this is the challenge in front of us. And I'm saying to you that we can't do this unless we go back into the reservoirs of what we are, Catholic and Irish. We have to go out there and we have to feel the wind in our hair, those of us that have hair. And we have to feel the rain on our face. And we have to feel the bog water seeping in through that hole in the wellies that you didn't know was there. We have to experience our country all over again with love and compassion and pride and reverence. We have to listen to the voices of the dead and chart this new path. And it's beginning to look as if we can't do it with anything we have at the moment. There are serious questions as to whether the tools which are to hand are fit for purpose. I don't know how else to put this. And I'm afraid that includes our excellent Catholic schools, which are excellent schools. But are they able to do this anymore? They take huge money from the government. They have no choice. I ran a Catholic school. They pay the staff. They pay the amount of money that comes in from the state. And I'm not being ungrateful. I'm just saying you pay the piper, you call the tune. For a long time, the state and the church had the same tune. And it was twice around the kitchen and mind the dresser. It was a regular old Kelly. The music has stopped. Or rather, it has changed. We can't afford the piper anymore. Only the state now can pay the piper. And so you have to question, there's no offence, whether we can do this in our Catholic schools. Now, does that mean that we have to leave our Catholic schools and start new schools, which will be private, and by definition, in the beginning, will be only for those who can afford them? I don't know, but I know those conversations are starting. And if I keep seeming to go on about this and become obsessive about it, there is no way this can be ignored for much longer. The conversations are starting and I'm telling you, either these young people are going to, they're going to leave. And if you think I'm wrong, you, you go back to John Waters. He's obsessing with this. This is the right thing to be obsessing about. If you're obsessing, obsess about this. Obsess with the hemorrhagic nature of Irish society. Irish society massively hemorrhages every so often in history. And we've seen a few of them already in the last Ooh, since the Second World War, we don't have to go back to the famine. There was a massive hemorrhage, about a million left in the 50s. An absolute disaster. A disaster probably on a par in some ways, in some ways with the famine in terms of its effects. A disaster. There was a massive hemorrhage again. I'm not sure of the figures, but I know there was in the 80s because I was a young man looking for a job in the 80s. And there were no jobs, or very few. I was a young teacher. God, Ireland was such a hopeless dump in that time. Then we faced another hemorrhage. People had started to come home in the boom, and then a massive hemorrhage again after the crash in 08. And now the church is facing. The church has already lost hundreds of thousands because of the scandals, but it's deeper, it's deeper, it's deeper, it's faith, it's a crisis, it's a massive crisis of faith. The scandals only speeded that up. And now we're set to lose the small number of Catholics who are there, the young Catholics, whom to annoy them I call the neocons, the neoconservatives, the young Catholics. They'll go, they'll go. They'll go to America, they'll go to Australia, they'll go to these new countries. It's not that these countries are friendly to Catholicism, but they're so huge that you can find a Catholic subculture operating in them. Now, unless we can create that, we're banjexed. We have to create that. The Brendan option, we have to build a boat. 
And that boat is cultural as well as spiritual. And I think they're intertwined here. It's incarnational. And you're saying, well, we've lost Ireland. Have we lost Ireland? We're still here. It's our country as much as anyone else's. It's our state as much as anyone else's. It's our flag as much as anyone else's. I went through a while after the abortion referendum when I found it hard even to sing the national anthem. I did. Do you remember the 1916 celebrations? Do you, you remember all the things? Now, some of the stuff the government did was very, very good. Do you remember where army officers visited the schools and presented a flag to the schools and, and the schools had to put up copies of the proclamation and everything? It was all good stuff. And then, I suppose, we lost the referendum and a lot of us felt we didn't belong in our country anymore. Now, I think a lot of us felt we didn't belong in our country kind of nearly after the first referendum. But in any case, I went down to one of the local schools dutifully because the flag was being presented. And I must say I was very proud of the young army officer and the two non-commissioned officers, I think it was, who were there with them. And I, they were a credit and they were very impressive. And I really thought that a lot of good stuff was happening there, you know. And then they came to singing the national anthem and I found it hard to sing the national anthem because I didn't feel it was, I was going through, you know, a bit of a crisis. I didn't feel it was my country anymore. And I, I kind of, I stood up very respectfully and I just stood there while they were singing it. And I looked over at one stage and the army officer was watching me and was smiling as if he knew what was going on with me. Anyway, as I was going, he made a point of saying hello. And I felt maybe he realised what I was going through. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it gave me a bit of heart. The thing wasn't as uncomprehending of us as I thought it was, the New Ireland. I don't know. I do know that we don't belong in it as we did to the other. I do know that we're still here. I do know that we carry the tradition. I do know there are only a few thousand of us in the country. That's an awful thing to say. Like there are how many million living in the country? There must be about five million on the island. I mean, that's an awful thing to say. But that's the way it is. Now we have to engage with this and we have to start working quickly or we lose the ones we have. And it could be the end of the faith in Ireland. Kierkegaard would have railed against it. Modern Ireland likes pasteurised everything. I wonder if we're not doing that with the child protection. I wonder if we're not producing pasteurised education, pasteurised life. We're trying to make kids so safe and the world isn't safe. You see something like Game of Thrones, which is wildly popular precisely because it showed how unsafe life is, which everybody knows in their heart, but you can't say anymore. I mean, even if you look at the rite of baptism, you look at what we did with it, because we wanted, we didn't want to frighten anyone. Look at the funeral rites. We don't wear black anymore. We don't sing the Dies Irae, that marvellous medieval hymn, The Day of Wrath. I think it was written by a friend of St. Francis. We didn't want to scare the little kiddies. The little kiddies are tougher than we think. We don't do the exorcism. Well, we do, but I mean, it's so tame in the baptism anymore. You know, the water and the salt of the exorcism. Exiabeo spiritus imunde. Ah, come out of him, you unclean spirit, and give way to the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. And the priest had to breathe three times on the child, on the unfortunate child. Come out of him. Come out of her. Magnificent. They're words that recognize the drama of the human situation. We come into the world naked and surrounded by demons. And the church faces the demons. I've started lately saying the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. The old Irish monks had a tremendous love for Our Lady and a tremendous love for St. Michael the Archangel. They prayed to him constantly. Maybe they knew something. And do you notice? You never say it alone. It's one prayer the congregation will thunder out with you. I think we have a great respect for the devil <laughs> in Ireland. I, I, yeah, I, I, I really think you're on a winner when you pray to St. Michael. Everyone joins in. And the young people are astonished that there is a prayer that actually has a bit of guts to it <laughs> and that names evil, which they know exists. You go on social media, you don't know evil exists, get out of here. These young people are very bright. They're very sharp. But we won't name it. 
if we're going to express the faith in our time, if it's going to come down the road, like Chesterton's crusade, tiny and unafraid, or like Mackin depicting Sir Arthur Aston at the beginning of, do you remember that novel, the first of his trilogy on Irish history, uh, Seek the Fairland? He would play Sir Arthur Aston, the Cavalier General at the gates of Drogheda, coming out to treat with the Cromwellians. The Cromwellians in black sitting on their horses and Aston dressed magnificently in silks with a feather in his hat, like a yellow hammer facing crows. That's how Mackin just takes him. Mackin has the fantastic turn of phrase. There's a man who loved his country and loved his faith. If we're going to do this, we're going to have to find a bit of guts. Going, old Kierkegaard would have, well, he'd have given us the shoe. When he said that the worst thing about his age was that it was trivial, it was paltry. It was, he, he didn't say this, but he could have said, it's pasteurized, pasteurized Christianity, pasteurized Christ. And as John Waters says, we're afraid of Christ. We're afraid of his sorrow and his rage. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We're afraid of him. And so we turn him into this boring, nice man that nobody believes in. And they're right not to believe him. Who'd be bothered with him? You wouldn't even want to go and have a pint with him. He'd bore you to death. But Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, would bore nobody. I, I'm verging on blasphemy, but you could drink porter with him. A decent, honest man could sink a pint with him. And didn't he love a glass of wine? Didn't he sit with his friends and enjoy a meal? This incarnational faith, we believe in the resurrection of the body. We believe in Ireland. We believe in the bog. We believe in this country that he has given us. I told you the story before, Father Mihon McGrail, when I complained about a wet day. God, I said, what a, what a depressing, a rotten wet day. And McGrail rounded on me and he said, you should wash your mouth out. He said, this is our weather. It's made us what we are. It's our beautiful country. He said, you should thank God for the rain falling on your face. And he's there with the beard and the prophetic and the eyes standing in his head. Great man, mighty man, late 80s, still going strong. We have to get down and dirty if we are going to do anything of worth and no more afraid of being failure. Do you know where we're heading? We're heading for the ghetto. Is there an Irish for ghetto? What should we could stick a sheen of father on the O? We're heading for on ghetto. Mo ghetto. Mo ghetto in hain. Me own little ghetto. That's where we're heading. The very places we bung the poor Jews in in the past every chance we got. And we Catholics have a lot to atone for, as John Paul said. That's where we're heading. If that's an irony of history, we deserve it. We should learn from them, how they have survived, that brilliant, gifted people. I'll tell you, you won't push them around. I heard a Jewish rabbi giving a talk one day on YouTube. He was a mighty man, he was hilarious. A rabbi, Abram, a Henry Abrahamson. He said, uh, the Romans, anyone met an ancient Roman lately? You know, the Greeks, anyone met a Greek lately? We're still here. <laughs> the Jews are still here. I thought, you're my man, I'll tell you. That's the way to give it out to them when you've been pushed around and walked on in history. All right, you might have had your faults too, but jeepers, what was done to them? And then we're here and we have been oppressed and we have oppressed and yet we're still here. We have been just and unjust. We have loved and hated. We have been faithful and we have betrayed, but we're still here. We're still Catholic. We're still Irish. We still have the faith. There may be less of us, but we're still standing here in the rain saying our prayers. Now we have to find a new way of doing this together. I'm telling you, we have to get together or we'll be picked off one by one by this culture. I'm not coming up with a conspiracy. We won't last. It's too hard on your own. Now, you're not going to get any welcome in the church for this. I heard somebody in a certain re religious order speak disparagingly of the brilliant young men whom that order have been lucky enough to attract. They're one of the few orders in Ireland who have actually turned a corner. And yet there are a lot of older priests in that order who disdain the work that has been done. Oh, they're very conservative. Oh, they're into Latin. They're attracting the brightest and best. 
who see that order rightly as Brendan's boat, as a narc, as a, a lifeboat in the water, and have not flooded into it in their thousands, but are going into it in numbers that would make you sit up in modern Ireland and take note. And they are of a quality and accomplishment that would make you take note. And yet they're being disparaged. And there are people who simply cannot see a gift horse without insulting it into its teeth. We'll get precious little support in doing this. And I'll tell you something else. We're going to frighten people trying to do this. People will be frightened by us. There are people in that order frightened by those young men. They're into Latin. They're frightened of a few words of Latin, like some of the old gospel tent Protestants. Thomas Merton talked about how the Protestants of his acquaintance were so intimidated by the sight of the word imprimatur on a Catholic book. Oh, the Inquisition had sanctioned this. Whereas what it said was, there was nothing in the book which was contrary to the Catholic faith. You could read it or not. You could take it or leave it. There would be people afraid of us. I'm beginning to think, now here I'm going to get seriously crazy. OK, but, I, I, you know, anyone who's listened to these podcasts by now knows that, you know, I'm a little bit touched, a little bit eccentric. God love me. So listen to the village idiot for another while. Maybe we should settle for being the village idiot. One thing about the village idiot is that he survives. He, he actually does get three meals a day because you feed the noggins like. You're afraid that God will judge you for being mean to him. Maybe we should settle for that, for being holy fools. I wonder, should we... Should we take the Irish language back from the, the grungy, middle-class, Gaelskull attending, pasteurised Irish patriots? Should we take the Irish language back and kick culture lass with it? Should we just rudely take it back and create a subculture that's Irish-speaking? And should we wait until we have good Irish? I said this to somebody and he said, oh, it'll take ages to learn Irish. It takes ages to learn good Irish. It doesn't take ages to learn crap Irish. You learn crap Irish fierce quickly. I can think of some Irish politicians have done very well speaking crap Irish for years. It's the only Irish they know. Gilga Crapach. Is that the word? On Goom, the Irish Commission, a marvellous name for a commission, a government commission, on Goom. <laughs> they, their job was to translate all of these texts and manuals and everything into Irish back in the 40s and 50s. and and so on, and, and, and often they just, I think, stick a sheen of father on words like, and just horse them in like, you know, because Irish, of course, wasn't an industrial language. English was, but the Irish wasn't. And that's why there's so much, I think, spirituality in Irish. I think we should seriously consider doing that. Maybe even speak pidgin Irish. I'm, not, I'm going to spare you my translation of pidgin into Irish. Maybe we could mix Irish and Latin, and we could speak bog Latin and bad Irish, and mix them all up together. A bit like brandy or port, which are basically, how did Auburn Moore once describe them? as where you mix up a whole load of stuff and you, you just boil it up for a while and it makes a jolly good drink. Maybe we should do that. I mean, don't the travellers have, they have their dialect, don't they? Don't they have Sheila or Zagaman? They're different words for it. And then in Tume, they had Tume slang, which was a mixture of local Tume slang and traveller slang, traveller argo. Tugum slagang, because you just stuck a G into every word to muck it up. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, maybe we should just go for this. I mean, don't the Hasidic Jews, they've got Yiddish. They won't speak Hebrew in, in Israel because Hebrew is a sacred language. And you don't go down and have an argument with the milkman in Hebrew because that's the sacred language you use for speaking to God. You don't take your car to the garage like in, in Hebrew. They use Yiddish, which they took from the Jewish experience in wasn't it Germany and Central Europe. That's why some of them wear those four hats. They came from Central Europe. Look, I'm kicking balls around here, but I, I, I'm getting seriously creative here. I, I just feel the creative juices flowing here. I mean, maybe we should also start dressing differently. Like the Amish or the Hasidic Jews. I think those four hats are brilliant. Could we come up with an Irish version of the four hat? I don't know, made out of weasel fur. Do we have weasels in Ireland? Stoats. Here again. I'm just firing it out to you there, so that you'll be nobody at these neo-cat, Irish cat gatherings without your weasel for a hat. There are no weasels in Ireland. It just occurs to me that there are no weasels in Ireland. We stoats. <laughs> but it doesn't sound as good. And we've mink now anyway, so we can, we, we can have the best. Whether we want them or not, they're there in all our rivers. 
All right, I can see I'm starting to get slowly senile here in the corner by the fire and nobody's going to end up listening to me. But I really think I have an absolutely crucial point here. Maybe we should just stop being afraid of being laughed at. Maybe we should just stop being afraid of being different. You know that wonderful phrase in the Psalms? Exultemus Domino, venite exultemus Domino. It's translated in the Psalms of come ring out our joy to the Lord. It's used as an invitatory for the office, for morning prayer. But it really means let us exult or rejoice in the Lord. Let us enjoy him. Let us rejoice in him. You know the way you do when, when you really enjoy somebody's company? You really enjoy the presence of someone you love. You rejoice in them. We should be empty in every pub in the country talking about the Lord without mentioning his name. We should be people of reading and charm and conversation. We should be pint of porter people. We should have a distinctive culture, an Irish Catholic culture. We should even invent an Irish Catholic dress. I don't see why not. I think we're going to have to step it out and show a bit of leg here. I really mean it. Do you remember, you remember that old song, that old country song, Step It Out Mary, My Fine Daughter? Step it out Mary if you can. Step it out Mary, My Fine Daughter. Show your leg to the country man. We are going to have to show a bit of leg here. A bit of ankle, as they used to say. We're going to have to step it out as the Catholic Church in Ireland. Find a new voice, our own distinctive voice. Our own culture. This isn't cultural Catholicism. That drives me cracked. Okay, cultural Catholicism is attempting to be Catholic without God. It doesn't work. That's like saying, well, I can't afford food, but gee, I have a great plate. I want to bring you back to Joseph Mary Plunkett. I want to bring you back to Pierce, to the GPO, to Pierce teaching in St. Andrews College, teaching those boys about their country. OK, I want to bring you back to John Waters and to look at the none of these people are perfect. OK, I'm not perfect and no disrespect, but you, dear listener, you're not perfect either. So don't, you know, get down off your high horse. We're not perfect, but we need to dream again. We need to love again as Catholics. We need to have a passion for the faith. We need to discover romance, the romance of the faith in our Celtic land. We need to be here believing in the mist. Now, are you going to come with me? And the last thing I said, come with me and dance in Ireland. Okay, at the end of this podcast, I'm saying, come with me and pray in Ireland. I am now going out to the bog to talk to God. St. Brendan, pray for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.